So now let's proceed with configuring our environment. To do so, we should first understand the environment. So we'll have a look at the network layout. So single node installation. Of course, this defaults to the simple snitch algo, which is for single DCs, as we've mentioned, which is already pre-configured. Pre so first, let's take a look at the schematic that we've whipped up. Let's have a look in our documents, cast DB. And at this particular PNG, this should bring up the architecture. So the architecture is as follows. We're done at net connections, firewalls. There's a DMZ with some systems in it and our core switches and internal systems. So let's focus in on the internal side or the 192.168.75 subnet. So we're using, as you can see from the shell, a box called UbuDesk 2. And that appears on the list as the following with its counterpart here. These are both DHCP. We've got two build boxes. These are staging systems, builds one and two. And they're at their, those IP addresses 101 and 102. But more importantly, the Cassandra ring is where we're going to focus our attention. So this is our ring. Now they aren't all connected by one cable. Each system's wired in to the core switches, but logically this is how they're presented or will be presented in the ring. So we've got six systems to work with, maybe a potential seventh, not sure yet, but six, three of which are Ubuntu, three of which are CentOS. So we can work with these guys. We'll start by configuring Linux CBT Ubu Serve 1, which is 110. This will be, if you will, the head node. Once it's configured, we'll then have the others join the node and see how the behavior reflects or changes accordingly. So 110 is our primary task to work with for this particular episode, if you will. So back to configuration of this single node. So the features are, of course, the assumption that a single DC configuration is being implemented using the single snitch method. And as we've mentioned, this method does not, so let's just clarify, this method does not recognize data center or DC, which we'll use going forward, and rack information. So we've mentioned with Cassandra, we can distinguish or assign, if you will, hosts to data centers and racks logically as they're mapped physically, which will influence routing decisions of data, which means, of course, clients connecting will be routing accord routed according to their relation or relativity to a particular data center and rack and it ensures that data are replicated to reduce or minimize failure. That's the whole idea. So single snitch, single data center. Now there are a number of requirements. For each system, again, you don't need to be root, but you should ensure that these components are present. We need to ensure that there's a JRE. JRE or JDK, preferably the Oracle JRE 6, currently 1.6 hotspot. But it will work with Open JDK, although if you check the DataStax documentation, it is against their suggestion that you use the Open JDK, which is, which is present across Linux distributions. However, you can install this particular JDK, the official Oracle JDK by downloading it. So we'll be doing that momentarily. So make sure that you have that in place. In addition, we need to ensure that when once we download it and install it and so on, that directories ensure, ensure appropriate directories are in place. And this includes, of course, where Java lives, which is usually beneath opt. And that's going to be for us opt Java. We'll create it if it doesn't exist. And then once Java is in place, we should ensure that JNA or Java Native Access, so Java Native Access JNA is installed. This provides Java with native access to the underlying operating system, so it improves as a consequence performance in a number of areas. So there aren't too many requirements. You just need a JRE or a JDK. For production systems, usually the JRE will suffice. Development is usually discouraged there. Make sure the directories are set up. You can reference Java from anywhere on the shell so it's in the path. 
which means we'll probably have to use update alternatives to ensure that the Java that's in use is the current version we expect. And then, of course, JNA. Cassandra will start with OpenJDK. Let's just note that Cassandra will run with the following stack in the event that you have this stack in place already. One, missing JNA. So, of course, this reduces performance, but it will run. It'll simply complain the log dump to stand it out. And two, with OpenJDK JVM. So it will work with this. We've tested it. it. certainly works. Online, you'll see references to it, but the suggestion is that you use the official JRE from Oracle. So with that said, let's go ahead and set up our environment. One, install JRE on target system. We'll begin, of course, with Linux EBT UbuServe 1, which is located at dot one one zero. Now we can pull it from our local system. Let's go ahead and get a browser going. JRE is about 23 megs. That should be no big deal. So let's go ahead and navigate to Oracle. And we'll look for products and services. Java is, of course, one of the major items. Let's go ahead and navigate to Java. And then somewhere in here, we should see the ability to download the latest Java. So we want Java platform. The SE is fine, and let's find our link. Again, it may switch by the time you've looked at it, so just follow through and find the Java plat Platform Standard Edition. And look for the various versions that are available. Let's go to Download. And this is the desktop. Let's just, that's version 7. We want to be able to pick across the versions, so let's just double check. Let's find the Java SE for developers. This will give us the option to pick the older version as well as amongst the JDK and JRE. So this is JRE again. JDK is the development kit. The JRE works for us, but this is 7. So since it's suggested for version for Cassandra 1, 2x, at least this point is Java 6. Let's go with this. This is update 38, the current that's available. So you, of course, pick whatever is appropriate for your environment. So let's go ahead and download. And then here are a number of versions for our systems, 586 or x64, either or, RPM for Red Hat CentOS systems. Ubu, we just get the normal bin files, and that should be good. So let's go ahead and pull this one, i586. Let's accept the license agreement. Now, this is, of course, a 32-bit version. If we want 64, pick x64. And that's, of course, the suggested version if your systems are 64-bit. But we're going to use this version for our intents and purposes. So that's in. So we've got this in downloads. We can copy this over to the target system. So we've got the JRE 1.6, and that looks good. So now we need to put this on the remote system, set up the environment. So let's get a shell going. Pull this up, separate window. Let's SSH as root over to the following system, not internal. That's catetcresolve.com to see what the resolution is like. It's actually using the loopback so it doesn't know the host. So let's just connect to the IP address for now. So it's going to be, you know, we'll worry about name resolution at some other point. So 75, and that'll be 110. And then once there, let's do a depackage list. It's a Debian system to see if there is JDK installed. And let's just search for Java altogether. That looks good. So that's just a JavaScript library. So it's clear. That means a which Java should come back with nothing. That means the alternatives hasn't been set. So that's good. So now let's move into opt, make directory Java. And this is where we will set up shop. So from our local system, let's bring this as the second window. Let's SCP or rsync, either or JRE over to the remote system. That's going to be root at following IP address into op Java. So I'll pop that in momentarily. And that'll be there. And let's just check that password again. And since we're going to be copying to all these systems, we should set up the SSH key. So that's on the remote system. So what we want to do is flag this executable so that we can actually extract its contents. 
And this will explode the contents to a tree, 1-6. So this will be 1-6 hotspot for us that we can use. So that's in place momentarily. So now, the other things that are of interest, as we've mentioned, we need to ensure that the system knows the default Java is this version. So in user bin, we want to place an entry so that when we do a reference to Java, such as which Java or Java, the system knows how to find it. So in Ubuntu-based systems, we use update alternatives. So let's go back to our notes and just ensure that that is documented and install JRE, make directory opt Java, then of course rsync JRE over to the remote system into opt Java and then explode it. So that's going to be change mod plus X opt Java star bin and then extract contents. So that's in place. Now we need to ensure, let's just include it as part of this list, that we update the alternative. So update alternatives to provide links to default Java. So E1, update alternatives, and we want to install in user bin, a reference called Java, which is simply known on the system as Java, which really points to opt Java and its directory JRE1638. So that's going to be 1.6038 bin Java, priority one. So this will create that initial entry. Let's minimize the browser, give us some room to see this. So currently, which Java shows nothing? Let's go ahead and update alternatives, which Java. Now Java has a reference. Now that that's there, what about the actual version? So Java version could not create the, the virtual machine. Let's just double check our entry here. That's one, I, one hyphen that is, 1638. The next thing is, let's just set Java again by using update alternatives one more time with the set command to be sure that it is referenced system-wide as a default JVM because systems can maintain multiple JVMs. So let's just be sure. So we've installed it, now we need to set it. Sometimes you get an error if you don't do both, sometimes you don't. So set Java to be its path into opt Java. So that's gonna be this full path here. And this will ensure that it's reference and no priority is necessary. So let's just copy this. And this will need to be performed on each system, obviously. So let's paste that in. So Java is now set. JNA is not installed. Now, the JNA that's suggested is available on GitHub. So let's get JNA and install it. So that's JRE. It's in place to download and install JNA. And that's the latest JNA. So install latest JNA. And we'll do so momentarily from GitHub. So github.com, you can just do a search, but it's under Twall JNA. And there's a jar file that houses the JNA. That is the JNA. So let's go back to this, and that's gonna be GitHub JNA. That'll take us to the JNA. Now we'll look for the JNA jar as one of the downloadable items. And this is some documentation about what JNA is its ability to provide low-level access to systems and improving the overall performance of Java code without having to reference external libraries. And this takes us over to the link to download it. You can just take this and paste it on the remote system. Let's just discard it. So we want this to be in the class path on the remote system on each node. So download and install latest JNA to Java, or let's say to Cassandra's class path. So one place this can be placed is wherever we decide to extract Cassandra on each node. So i.e., let's say the user's home, Cassandra, and then let's say install directory, wherever that happens to be. We'll just extract it under a top level directory calling it, let's say Cassandra, and then that'll be where we place the JNA, the copy of the JNA. And you can always copy the stack from one system to another, and that'll work just fine for simplifying the installation. So that means we need Cassandra. So let's go ahead 
And before we download GitHub to that particular directory, or we can download it and then copy it over. So that's that's fine as well. So since we have the URL, let's just do a wget on this URL and paste it into the user's home directory on the remote system. So note, place this into Cassandra temporarily until we download Cassandra. And of course you can change the order. So let's go back to that remote system we will serve one and add the user. So add user Cassandra. Specify a password. Cassandra no SQL let's say user and all the defaults that go with it. So now we have a user. That's SUN as Cassandra. And now we have a reference to pull this in. So now the jar will come down and that begins the stack. Let's also make directory Cassandra within which we'll download the latest version. Now you can organize it by version. So for example, 1.2 and migrate that way, making it a little bit easier as you move on. And for now, let's move the JNA into this directory. And this way we can just copy the entire tree to remote systems using our sync. So JNA is here, but here is, but it's going to ultimately be placed into either the directory beneath Cassandra or in user share Java and then simply linked out. We have two options. So let's just clarify this. So download it and place it into this directory, i.e. here, or user share Java. Both are in the class path. Or if you place it somewhere else, then ensure that the class path for starting Cassandra is updated accordingly. Now, so far as downloading Cassandra, relatively straightforward, download Cassandra. Now, it's a Java app, so we don't need to build anything. So long as the JRE is there, it'll run, or JDK. So download Cassandra to the user's home directory. So Cassandra, Cassandra 1.2, and then extract here. So extract here and then figure out what to do with the JNA and it will be almost ready to fire it up. So let's go back to our browser. And let's do a Cassandra.apache.org top level package. And again, as we've mentioned, maybe you'll want to consider third party support from data stacks for your production deployments. But if you're new to the world of NoSQL, as we for the most part all are, then you'll probably want to consider downloading directly from Apache without all the extra bells and whistles, get a feel for how it behaves under the hood before committing to a particular bundle. Certainly Datastax is the officially supported bundle. So here's some URLs. Let's take maybe this one. This is suggested based on our location. So let's copy link address and it thinks it's in Italian. It isn't. So on that remote system, we should then be able to just wget into this particular location, followed by a tarx zvf, which will create the tree momentarily. And once that tree is in place, then we should figure out what to do with our JNA. So one thing to do, as we've mentioned, is placing it into user share Java. Maybe that's the approach we'll take. But then for each system, we'll have to do it. Or you can place it into the class path and then just copy the tree over. Either or will work. So now we've got it here. Let's do a tarx zvf Apache. That'll extract the whole version for us. And that'll make the path longer when you reference it, but that's fine. That way you keep things clean. So one, two, zero versus one, two, one, etc. So as we've mentioned, this is the top level container for Cassandra. It's relatively clean. And as far as class paths, if you simply place this live directory is always in the class path when Cassandra is fired up. If you place a JNA in there as say JNA.jar, it'll find it, or you can link it from user share. So for that, we need to have the appropriate privileges. So if we exit this shell and say into user share Java, for example, which is created by default, notice one library. Let's move Cassandra, Cassandra into this directory and then re-sun as the user into Cassandra, just tab it all out into lib then ln symbolically user share Java JNA as simply JNA.jar. And then you can always update the versions as you go across. That's one way to do it. That gets it going. So this is one stack. Let's do UCHS just to get a sense for what the trace is. 70 megs. This is a full Cassandra stack ready to go so long as we know where Java is. So the Java version 
it's on the system, it's a version that's of interest. And as long as that's in place and JNA is available, then we're almost set to go. Now, when you execute Cassandra as an on privilege user, as non root user, there are issues concerning limits that are permitted to the process, the Cassandra run process or non privileged executed, non privileged executed user Cassandra, so or or any other non privileged user for that matter. So one thing to consider is to update your limits.conf, which usually resides in ETC security. And this should reflect memlock limits for soft and hard for the Cassandra user or the user with which you execute Cassandra it may not be called Cassandra. So for example, Cassandra soft limit for memlock, set it to unlimited. One of the key bottlenecks in executing any Java application is its heap and its ability to access resources from the system, both soft and hard lock. So we'll just make them both unlimited. Of course, this can crash or cause your system to panic. That's the case for any Java application. And Cassandra is no exception. It needs a lot of memory to execute. It usually takes, as we've mentioned, a quarter to half of your system just to fire up. So we should place these directives into limits.conf so there's no problem concerning the Cassandra processes ability to grab memory resources. Sometimes it'll still error out and sometimes when you run it as root you won't see any errors that you see as a normal user so that raises whether or not you should execute it as a privileged user. That you can do but since we're operating in development mode here we'll just run as a non-privileged user. So before end of file let's just include for example the following and include our directives. And bring this in, removing any superfluous characters. So that gives us a soft and hard lock, memlock limits to unlimited. And that ensures that Cassandra doesn't complain as much and is able to grab the resources that it needs. So for Red Hat, you essentially download the same JRE or copy it from your Ubuntu systems, update your alternatives similarly without using update, which we'll look at as well when we bring those systems into the fold. So we've got Cassandra, of course, when you download it from Apache, confirm whatever sums are there. Just be sure that the sums match. We assume that that's something you do by default anyway. So you can have a look at any of the sums associated. Here's, for example, SHA-1 on the file. Ensure that this matches. Our assumption is that the Apache site hasn't been hacked, so it should match. Let's drop this particular element view. And, of course, obviously means that you just take a look at it. So let's re-SU and have a look at Cassandra 1.2 where the original file is. So of course a SHA-1, or SHA sum against Apache should yield the value and that's going to be 1.2 bin that this and that's a 22 terminating in 2b. So the file hasn't been tampered with, no problems, no worries there. So now we've got Cassandra in place. Let's take a look at the directory structure before we actually fire it up. And once we've got it fired up, then we'll take a look at querying it, creating data, querying it, acclimating, and so on. So next step for us, peruse directory structure, just to be familiar, of course. So some key files, and they're beneath, of course, conf. That's where you configure. That's where you start with any configuration. So config files are all in this particular directory. So some key files exist, including, for example, Cassandra environment.sh. And this, of course, as we've alluded to earlier, or mentioned earlier directly, that it sets the heap size, finds a JV JVM, among other things. So it configures the environment for launching Cassandra on your system. So it's a shell script. Let's take a brief look into conf. And here are the config files. Not all are used by default. Let's take a look at Cassandra environment.shell. And as you look through, you'll see how it goes through calculating using standard shell script semantics. So it queries the system if the uname's in Linux. It runs these steps, FreeBSD, SunOS. It's multi, of course, platform capable. Half RAM, quarter RAM. It detects, looks for the JVM on the system, sets some variables. Etc. So it defines the environment, it gives Java the resources that it needs. That's the purpose of that particular file. 
We've also got some other ones, for example, the main config file, Cassandra, we'll just ignore these for now because they're not used by default. Rack DC and topology are means with which to influence replication. So Cassandra YAML is the main config file. This is what we're worried about. This is where we define things. So Cassandra YAML is the primary config file. This is where you make changes. So define startup directives here. For example, cluster name, RPC port, or listener. Etc. So this is the primary config file that we are concerned with. As we've mentioned, the other property files such as topology and rack DC influence replication. Let's take a look at the YAML file. So in here, one important directive that we see is a cluster name. Before you fire up a Cassandra cluster, no matter how small or big, from one node to a million nodes or infinite nodes, define a cluster name. So in here, we're interested in, let's say, a two one cluster name and we want to define this to be something that's logical that will be worn by every other system if we're going to copy this config across to the other systems so instead of test cluster for example how about we come up with maybe a name that's going to last such as web cluster one for example this becomes our cluster name this will persist across all the systems so you'll see it uniquely so web cluster one presuming it's a web app or web app cluster one or something along those lines. Web app cluster, maybe web app cluster one becomes our name. So update it accordingly and any change you make, of course, comment it. So classroom so we can easily find it and then paste your own directives accordingly. So this is going to be cluster name and that's its name. So all hosts join a particular cluster. Of course, you can run clusters in simultaneously on the wire, the same wire, but it's usually advantageous to run one big cluster and then just segment your data using key spaces. So perhaps we'll just reiterate that. So ideally define one large cluster for your organization, then segment or shard data based on key spaces. So a key space for one web app versus another, or within a particular web application, multiple key spaces to handle multiple areas of your configuration. So as we've alluded to earlier, you may have, let's say, a key space that deals strictly with the users on your system, the various users, and then others that deal with the attributes associated with those users, all within the same cluster. Another directive is number of tokens. Now, presuming that your cluster will include two or more nodes, you should uncomment number of tokens 256 and set this accordingly to a default of 256 for equally matched or equally sized hosts. So num tokens, this sets off the virtual token generation feature of the latest instance or version of Cassandra. So we'll set this to 256. It'll auto handle the tokens for us. And num tokens, as we've mentioned, influences how Cassandra assigns tokens to the members of the cluster. So two two num tokens defaults to two fifty six. And if, as we've mentioned, this provisions virtual nodes with equally assigned number of tokens. And a big note here is that. If you operate systems of disparate or varying capacity, size the number of tokens below 256 for less capable participants or nodes such that fewer tokens will be assigned to weaker or less capable systems. So all things being equal, all systems have number of tokens set to 256. 
As far as other directives, well, the defaults for a single system are all set already. So we'll skip over the hinted handoff, so on and so forth. But in terms of listening to ports, the default configuration works good and well for one system. As far as where Cassandra stores data, varlib Cassandra, as well as varlib Cassandra commit log. These are the two main areas of concern. So, 823, for example, or 823 will be as follows. Data file directories, and you can spread the data across multiple directories, by the way, so you're not relegated to one directory in the event that you need to spread data across, let's say, Hadoop or multiple other mount points. So this defaults to varlib Cassandra data. This is where, of course, the long-term storage, so long-term DB info, your key space info, your column families will live. And then A24 commit log directory. This is your transaction log. And this defaults the the same hierarchy, varlib Cassandra, which because of the version we're using, it's not the data stack bundle, has yet to be created. So this is going to be commit log, of course, as indicated in the config, varlib Cassandra commit log. And this is, of course, transaction appended data. So these are two areas of concern. Both should, in of course production, live on disparate hard drives or partitions, partitions, drives, etc. However, your storage is organized so that if one fails, you lessen the likelihood of losing data. So since data are most quickly written to the commit log in the mem tables, then the chance of losing data if the commit log is on a different drive from the data file or data files will be slim to none. But if they're on the same and that disk fails, then your only saving grace will be another node or in memory and somehow you provision storage on the fly, maybe through virtualization or otherwise. So commit log, data log, and some caching and so on. I won't go through all the directives for now. I just want to get those changes in. This is good for a single node. Defaults are all in place. It'll fire up as necessary. Now, we've yet to make the directories for Cassandra to do its business. Of course, it'll complain. So. Six, create default hierarchy container. And of course, that's going to be var lib Cassandra. And so far as logging, Cassandra logs information independently of its var lib storage. That's var log Cassandra. So that's going to be containers. And we didn't actually look at the logging. That's in the log file the properties file. So that's going to be this as well as var log Cassandra. Of course, if you use a bundle stack, these were all created for you with the appropriate privileges. So these should be all owned by, of course, Cassandra. So we will need to drop our SU and make directory var lib Cassandra, followed by a chown Cassandra Cassandra of var lib Cassandra. And we can then follow that up with a make directory var log Cassandra for the logging and the same chown of Cassandra of var log Cassandra. That way it'll be able to write without needing any sort of privilege whatsoever. And a confirmation of var lib Cassandra var log should confirm that both are in place. And an LSLD should show that they're both owned by Cassandra. So now we know it can write to its various places. As far as, let's just go back to the SU for a moment. Back to the users, Cassandra hierarchy and tab down into conf. As we've mentioned, the logging is handled by the log4j properties file for the server. So log4j server properties spells out where it logs so far log, Cassandra system log. So this is real places. These are the variables that drive what it logs, the rate at which it logs, how much information is retained, so on and so forth. So we're pretty much at a stage now where we can launch Cassandra in the, the foreground. And we're going to run most of these instances in the foreground. Scripting it, init descripts, that's not important to us. We can launch it in the foreground, and we'll see the ports to which it binds. So again, we don't want to run as privileged users. So let's go back up a bit to start Cassandra. In Cassandra, if you omit the F option, it launches in the background. This looks for the JRE. 
it loads all these tokens. That's the 256 tokens that are auto configured. It starts a Java messaging service and it starts also JMA, Java management on 7199, Thrift 9160. Messaging happens on 7000 for the gossip service. That's a protocol that's used to move information to and fro participating members. So always look at when your services fire up. Here's a long class path, which of course includes the live directory beneath the Cassandra hierarchy that we've already set up. It knows which JRE it's using. It'll probably complain if it's not 64-bit and determines that the system is 64-bit somewhere. Here it reads Cassandra 64-bit, so we just download a 64-bit version. That will should fix that issue. And it tells you how much memory is in the mem table, 163 megs. So your, your global mem table for this system would be like memcached. You could store items in there and never hit disk, for example, but have the backup of disk in the event that the system goes down. And then we see the tokens. Again, token handling is all, for the most part, handled automatically by Cassandra at this stage because it was a, a, a sore point with Cassandra administration that we had to calculate tokens and recalculate as the number of systems adjusted in the ring. So Cassandra does that for us automatically. And then it says it's listening for thrift clients. Now, what does that mean? If we nmap it, let's say from our local system, so nmap, let's say, remote system 75110, this should reveal the ports that are, vo or that are open that it can see on the wire. Now, notice it doesn't come back with the non-standard ports. You have to do a more intensive scan to see it. So a casual cursory TCP-based scan doesn't reveal that Cassandra is running on that remote system. Now, so far as our DNS configuration, we'd have to update it either manually or automatically. Let's go ahead and sudo nano etc resolve.com so that we don't have to keep putting this in. Of course, it'll read, don't modify this, do it through the network manager. But for now, we'll just put this in to our resolvers, which know where to find our internal systems, and then we'll update the network manager. We'll just get rid of the 127 for now. So if we dig Linux CBT Ubu serve one, cbt.internal, that should fix matters and that finds it. And a search will be of Linux cbt.internal. So that's looking good. So now we can find our hosts. Now back to this system. Cassandra is running in that window. Let's SSH as Cassandra. In fact, let's copy our key over. We'll SSH copy. Let's make sure we have a key first before copying it. So let's take a look at our SSH folder. Indeed, we have an RSA, so SSH copy it. And that's going to be to Cassandra since we'll be using that often at Linux CBT Ubu Serve 1. Linux CBT dot internal. And that should momentarily give us access to that remote system. Now let's connect to it. Ubu Serve one and that should pop us on but we want to do so as cassandra and that should connect us momentarily so that looks good so now we're there and if we do our netstat ntl we should see the new ports 7000 as we've mentioned gossip communications now by default you can't gossip off of loopback to other hosts so this will need to be updated accordingly when we bring other nodes on to the wire loopback 9160 that's there so that thrift clients can connect and we have default thrift clients that we'll be looking at momentarily. 7199 for Java management. This is of course available on the wire and supports the passing of commands and data storage from other Cassandra nodes, but we're not yet set up for those other nodes. So it's half configured if you will. So as a note, Cassandra binds to the following. TCP ports, and if it changes with subsequent releases, you'll find it through Google and or the Cassandra website, but you've got, for example, TCP 9164 Thrift for Thrift clients, i.e. the Cassandra, the original Cassandra CLI, as well as the SQL client, 7199 for Java management, or JMX. And this facilitates commands and data storage. So for your firewalls, you'll need to have this enabled. 
And then, of course, 7,000 for gossip, which by default is not available to other nodes. But this is for internode communications. You'll find that with any cluster configuration, there's bound to be some TCP mains. And let's just note various RPC ports via JMX. There's bound to be some means of internode communications. Has to be. It's the only way that the nodes can keep track of each other. As we've mentioned, Cassandra every second pings or checks the other node to know whether or not that node is up and running. So providing you've gotten this far on any OS build, we've used Ubuntu here, this would work for Debian as well, then your system's up. It's up and running, it has no data. But if you check, for example, var log Cassandra, certainly the system logs there, so you can have a quick look at that just to see with the appropriate privileges and the Cassandra system log. You should see that it came up and ditto for var live Cassandra. Now again, with the bundle, this all comes, like the data stack bundle, this is all handled for you, but if you can do it manually, then the bundle is easy to deal with. This is why we've chosen or elected this particular route. So now Cassandra's up on one node. It's quote-unquote a cluster. It's a single node cluster, so if you down it, data are no longer available. So next, we'll get into querying usages of, or means of defining data, querying from multiple clients, and then once that's all in place and we're comfortable with Cassandra, then we move on to the actual cluster implementation across a number of nodes.